Welcome to our topics class. We're studying creation, the early earth, and we're on the third lesson today. And I'm going to ask you if you would please take your Bibles and open to the first chapter of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. And before we get started, let's look to God in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask you now as we come before you, we ask you, Lord, to bless this time. Lord, we pray that as we probe into the pages of Scripture and then see the great wondrous creation that you have given, Lord, we just lift up our hearts and worship to you, Lord, because you're a mighty God and you're a great God above all gods and your hands have prepared the dry land, the sea is yours and you made it. And all of these things, Lord, we, uh, we see about us every day, the, the lakes and and the trees and everything, Lord, it's all part of your wondrous creation. And they all testify to the fact that thou art God. And so, Lord, we worship you this morning and we pray, Lord, that you would bless this time as, as we turn our thoughts to uh, your, cre uh, your creation that you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the... Um, the first verse of the book of Genesis. So by the way, just, uh, I see a number of people coming up for uh, lesson sheets. Maybe, uh, Gene, you could pass, pass those out. If you didn't get a lesson sheet, hold up your hand. Should have done that sooner. Okay, the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So verse 1, we label it creation. And then in verse 2, we label that catastrophe because a catastrophe has taken place. And if you remember the words tuhu and boohoo that we studied last week, the, the scripture says that the uh, earth was without form and void. And that's the Hebrew words tuhu and boohoo means empty, uh, ruined, a wreck, undistinguishable ruin, and so forth. And so the earth became that way. You remember Satan was the original earth dweller, and when he sinned against God, how he said that, um, you know, I will be like the Most High. And so I, I can just hear, this. the Bible doesn't say this, but I can just hear God laugh and say, all right, I'm gonna wreck this whole creation, and you wanna be God, go ahead, and show that your God create, cre uh, create something, fix it. And of course, Satan can't do that because he's not God. So then God begins to work again and to renovate that which he has just previously ruined. And if you didn't get last week's lesson, you need to pick up one of them. They're up here behind me. Um, we have all the verses in there, how uh, God uh, uh, ruined his original creation after Satan fell. So the second verse says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Well, when the tuhu and boohoo took place, uh, there was no sun there was this darkness. The sun was someplace else because God just uh, spread everything out in his universe. And there was no sun shining on the earth, so the earth was in darkness. And it was without form, that's tuhu, and it was void, that's boohoo, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the verse doesn't end there. Then it says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the of the waters. God's spirit began to move on the face of the waters. Now this is akin to what we read in Psalm 104 verse 30. It says God, uh, The scripture says, God sendeth forth thy spirit, they are created, that's verse 1, and thou renewest the face of the earth, that's verse 2. It's spirit of God began to renew the face of the earth. Now that word renew is an interesting word. It's used a number of times in scripture and it's translated at least three different ways. Renew is one of them. In 2 Chronicles, if you notice there on your note sheet, 2 Chronicles 24 4, 
It says, It came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of God. Well, that word repair, that's the same Hebrew word that is translated renew. God renewed the face of the earth. He repaired the face of the earth. And then we have it again in 2 Chronicles 24 in verse 12. In fact, it's in verse 12 two times. Uh, we read there, The king and Jedidiah gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord and hired masons and carpenters, and here's the first time they use it, to repair, to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So it's renew and repair and mend. This is what God began to do in that uh, second verse, the end of, of verse 2. He began to renew, repair, and mend the earth. The cataclysmic events that he had sent upon the earth, and not just the earth, but the entire universe. And so um, this, uh, this begins uh, to, uh, to, pl to play out here now. God is going to fix what he has wrecked. I think he gave Satan a chance to fix it. And the Bible doesn't say that, but I just think he must have. And Satan was totally powerless to repair or mend or renew. So in Isaiah 61, 4, if you notice there, this is about the Jews at the start of the millennium. And they shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities the desolation of many generations. That's what the Jews are going to do at the start of the millennium. After the Holocaust of Armageddon, they're going to have all the repairs and renewing to do. Well, this is what God did. The Jews are going to do the same thing on a much smaller scale that, uh, as what God did here between verse 2 and verse 3. And so he's preparing the earth, getting it ready for mankind to dwell in there. Now, verse 3 tells us, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now some have taken this to mean that God created light in verse 3. That is not what it is talking about. God never did create light because God is light. Light didn't have to be created. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, we read that God created darkness. However, um, when God says, let there be light, he's talking about the planet Earth. That's what we're talking about here, planet Earth. And so he says, let there be light, which means light on the Earth. So what did he do? He brings the Earth into the orbit of the Sun. So now there is light on the Earth. So verse 3 there is, the Earth is brought into orbit. And then in verse 4 and 5 we read, And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light, from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. What happens there in verses 4 and 5? Well, in verse 3, he brings the earth into orbit around the sun. Let there be light. And then in verse 4 and 5, he starts it spinning. And it's been rotating on its axis ever since. And that's, he, that's how he divides the day from the, from the night. The light is divided from the darkness. And uh, interesting enough, in the 38th chapter of Job, verses 12 through 14, there in, the, uh, in your note sheets there, it says, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth? So this verse is about the earth that the wicked might be shaken out of it, it is turned as clay to the seal. It is turned as clay to the seal. Which means, it's, it, he likens it unto a potter that is uh, going to make something. The potter takes the lump of clay and he puts it on the seal. And then he's, w with a foot pedal or some such a device, he starts it spinning, and then he, he starts to shape whatever he is going to, uh, ever, he's going to make, a vase or, or a bowl or whatever it's going to be. It's spinning around when he makes it. Well, God likens this, the earth, to the potter, uh, the clay turning 
on the seal there. So way back then in the book of Job, Job was the oldest book in the Bible, he knew, they knew that the earth was rotating on its axis. It's been rotating on its axis ever since Gen uh, Genesis 1-4 here. So the earth begins to rotate. God brings it into orbit and then he uh, causes it to rotate, separates the light from the darkness, the day from the night. And then in verse 6 through verse 8 we read, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Now a firmament is, uh, another word for firmament is the word expanse. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now in this particular part, portion that we just read is where God adds the atmosphere. An atmosphere is important if man and plants are going to live here upon the earth. Now notice that it states here that he divides the waters under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. The original earth, as we see it in verse 2, is covered with water. And that water extended right up from the earth's surface all the way up to the edge of space. You have this water. And when God adds the atmosphere, he divides the waters. So there's water under the firmament, that would be the water here on the earth, and there is still water above the firmament, above the atmosphere. And that is called the water canopy. Now the canopy is mentioned twice in scripture. It's mentioned right here. Let's look at it again right here. Verse six, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. The firmament is an expanse. Let this expanse divide the waters from the waters. And verse seven, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So now we have water on the surface of the earth and water above the earth, shrouding the earth in a water canopy. Now, because it would be up at the edge of space, it would be frozen water or ice. Now we have this again in the New Testament. If you'll turn, please hold your finger in Genesis, but turn please to 2 Peter. And in the book of 2 Peter, Peter tells us a little more about this water canopy that was there at the original uh, earth or the, in Genesis here. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, and beginning with verse 3, Peter says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days evolutionists, oh no, scoffers, <laughs> walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, and by the way, the next part of this fourth verse, there is a name for what they say. It's called uniformitarianism. And they believe exactly what the last part of verse four says. Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's not true. All things do not continue as they were. We just saw this catastrophe that happened here after creation. Then in the time of Noah with the flood, there's another catastrophe that happened. So all things do not uh, continue on as they were from the creation. Verse 5, for th this they willingly are ignorant. Notice this, willingly are ignorant. All the evidence of creation and still they teach evolution in the, high, in the public schools. Uh, evolution has not a shred of evidence to support it. And nonetheless, they are willingly ignorant. Willingly. They want to be ignorant. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. There's the canopy. The earth was standing out of the water and in the water. There was water above the earth and there was water on the surface of the earth with the atmosphere in between. And verse 6 says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. 
So the um, canopy was established there. Now this canopy, it came down in the days of Noah. That was what caused, the main cause, there was a couple of causes, but that was the main cause of the flood. But as long as that canopy was up there, life on earth was much, much different than we know, uh, than we know it today. Well, God puts the atmosphere up here above the waters. And uh, the word he uses there is the heavens. Now there's three heavens. The Bible teaches us there are three heavens. There is, in fact, if you notice right at the bottom of your note sheet there on the first page, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul says that he was caught up to the third heaven. Well, the third heaven is the presence of God. And the Word of God tells us that uh, there are three of these heavens. Look with me, if you will, at verse 20. G Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. And then he says, Fowl, birds, that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Where do the birds fly? In the atmosphere. But God calls it heaven because that's the word. Firmament is the word for heaven here. And so where do the birds fly? In heaven number one. That's the first heaven, the atmosphere. Then the second heaven is space where the stars and uh, moon and sun and planets where they all are. And we read about them in verse 15. Look at verse 15. He says, let them be for lights. Where? In the firmament of the heaven. This would be the second heaven, to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So we got the first heaven, which is the atmosphere. We got the second heaven, which is space. And then we got the third heaven, which is the presence of God. Paul said he was caught up into the third heaven. So um, the earth begins to rotate on its, on its axis, and God is beginning now to, to uh, create and get the earth ready for man to dwell in. Now that we're going to study today the first heaven, the atmosphere. It's located between the canopy that is above and the surface of the earth, which is, which is below. And the earth was uh, entirely water at this point. Now, we'll just go and jump ahead for just a minute. In verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. See, that hasn't happened yet. That's in verse 9. We're only as far as verse 8 here. And so the whole surface of the earth at this point is, is water. And God puts the atmosphere in between the water above the firmament and the water that is below the firmament. And this atmosphere weighs 15 pounds per square inch. Every moment of our lives, we have 15 pounds per square inch of atmosphere pressing down on us. Now, we don't notice it because God created us to live that way. But if, if you could go out into space and take off your spacesuit, you'd explode. Because the human body is made in such a way that it is to withstand that 15 pounds per square inch of pressure that is pressing down on you. You know, there are deep sea fish. God made them to uh, withstand the tremendous pressures of being down, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of feet down under the water. Water is heavy. It, it, it presses on these fish. And sometimes if they catch them and bring them up, they explode because they're not built to, uh, to uh, not have all that pressure on them. And uh, they, they have to operate with that pressure. Well, man is the same way. 15 pounds per square inch. But you know what? The Word of God tells us about that, too. Look at Job 28, 25. It says, to make the weight for the winds. wonder how Job knew that the winds or the air had weight. But he did because God told him. Now the atmosphere, in addition to supplying oxygen for men and animals, it also supplies carbon dioxide and nitrogen for plant life. And the atmosphere is used, very useful, because it conducts sound. So not only do we breathe, 
the atmosphere, but the atmosphere conducts sound. If, you, if, uh, if there was no atmosphere, you wouldn't hear me this morning. Maybe that'd be a blessing. But uh, you wouldn't hear me this morning because uh, two people could stand side by side in a vacuum and shout at the top of their voice and they wouldn't hear each other because so it takes the atmosphere to conduct the sound. And so we have sound, uh, which space, by the way, is a vacuum, totally silent out there in space. I always have to laugh when they talk, these evolutionists talk about the Big Bang. There couldn't have been a bang. Space is totally silent. It's a vacuum. Well, anyways, um, that's one of the functions of the atmosphere. So it supplies oxygen, carbon dioxide, then nitrogen. It conducts the sound. And then also it burns up meteorites before they can strike the Earth. The Earth would be peppered with meteorites. We, you ever see a picture of the moon and uh, all the pockmarks on the moon? Those are from uh, comets and meteors and so forth that are striking the moon. We don't have that on Earth. Very rarely does one get, make it through the atmosphere and hit our planet, thanks to the atmosphere for it. And then it, the nitrogen in the atmosphere fertilizes plants and the atmosphere fills out the deadly cosmic rays of the sun. We would be dead in minutes if we were stand out in sunlight with no atmosphere about it. It filters out those cosmic rays. The atmosphere also carries pollen and seeds, and so the uh, vegetation spreads over the face of the Earth. The atmosphere of the early Earth was richer than it is today, and uh, all men and animals were at that time vegetarians. Now this is the atmosphere that existed with the canopy up there. It was much denser and it was much richer. Look with me at verse 29 of Genesis chapter 1. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Man and animals were vegetarians when the earth existed, the antediluvian earth, with this water canopy over it. There was no need to eat meat. This, the, uh, uh, apparently the atmosphere was so rich in nutrients that uh, they, they didn't eat meat. Now, as soon as that canopy came down, that was the flood. And in Genesis chapter 9, God comes, or, uh, I'm sorry, Noah comes out of the ark and God speaks to him. And notice Genesis 9, 3. Here's what God tells Noah. First thing he tells him when he leaves the ark. He says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. He says, no, I want you to become a carnivorous. I want you to become a meat eater. And then in the fifth verse, he says, and surely your blood, the, your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it. He says, watch out, Noah, because some of the animals are going to become carnivorous also. And that's the way it is now. And it wasn't that way originally. Both man and animals were non-carnivorous. Now it's going to be that way again. Because when the canopy is restored during the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, that canopy is going to go back up there again. And life is going to be like it was in the days of Noah and before. And the Word of God tells us in the book of Isaiah that the lion shall eat straw like the ox, uh, the uh, uh, wolf and the lamb shall dwell together, and goes on and on and on. Gives a lot of uh, illustrations of that in, uh, in the book of Isaiah. Well, it's going to be that way during the millennium. But today, animals and man are both carnivorous. Now, apparently, the plants, when the canopy came down, Apparently the plants no longer had the nutrients to sustain life. So God told man and beast to eat meat. Now, there have been attempts, successful attempts, of man to recreate that antediluvian atmosphere 
and they have come up with some amazing results. Uh, we have something that is called a hyperbaric chamber, and it's used to simulate the antediluvian atmosphere, and um, the results are quite amazing. There's a picture of one, and professional teams use these, these uh, hyperbaric uh, chambers. In fact, uh, a lot of National Football League, National uh, Basketball Association, National Hockey League, I see the Red Wings are on that list. They, uh, they needed a little more than that yesterday though, but uh, <laughs> they're on the list there, they, they use it. And when they do this, they have found that healing time is nearly twice as fast. So things were different back there in the days of Noah. And uh, there's a picture of a one-person chamber. That's what would be used uh, uh, for just one person at a time. And they have tried to grow fruits and vegetables that way, uh, particularly over in Japan. And here's some of the vegetables and fruits that they have produced huge uh, in size. And uh, Dr. Kiai Mori, I guess you pronounce his name, from the University in Tokyo, he raised tomato plants under this plastic greenhouse that filtered out the UV lights, ultraviolet lights, and he pressurized the carbon dioxide to the stems of the plants, and this is the result that he's got, the huge tomato plants. And there's a, a size of a man by comparison, and they were able to, uh, they were able to make these. Now, the Bible tells us, back there in the book of Genesis, the sixth chapter, that there were giants in the earth in those days, after that in which the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and so forth. But there were giants in the earth. And under the original atmosphere that existed then, giantism was not the exception, but it was the rule. And many archeological finds today have found evidence of this giantism that existed at Walkerton, 20 miles south of South Bend, Indiana, a group of amateur, amateur archeologists opened a mound in, in 1925. They unearthed skeletons of eight giants ranging from eight to nine feet long, and they're all wearing heavy copper armor. Remember the giant um, uh, Goliath there, when he came out against David, he had heavy armor that he wore. Well. They could, uh, a giant so strong he could keep, uh, he could wear that. And then they found a skeleton nearly 10 feet long in the Humboldt Lake of uh, uh, Nevada in uh, Lake Bed in June of 1931. And then in, uh, in uh, here we have a drawing of an 11 foot, six inch man that was found in an Italian coal mine. Uh, they, they were digging coal in the coal mine. They came across this skeleton. Now, this is just a drawing of it, but he was a man 11 foot, 6 inches. A 12 foot skeleton was found by soldiers in Lompoco Rancho, California in 1883. They reburied the main remains for some reason. Uh, another 12 foot skeleton was reported in many papers near Tucson, Arizona in 1891. The man had, this is interesting, six toes, long hair, and a bird-shaped headdress. Remember some of the giants in the Bible had six fingers and six toes. They have found fossils of grasshoppers over two feet long. They have found dragonflies with a three-foot wingspan and cockroaches over 18 inches have been found in the fossil record. And this is the one that gets me. Eight foot centipedes of fossil, eight and a half feet long, they have found. They have found cattails of 60 feet long. They have been found in a sedimentary rock. And there's a bunch of automobiles piled up to show you how many it would take to go up 60 foot high. They have found fossil remains of beavers nine feet long. And then they have found a, a jaw of a beaver that must have been between seven and eight foot. And look at this next one. 
This is on display at the Yale Museum, New Haven, Connecticut. A turtle, look at the size of that turtle. There's a man standing next to him. They found a donkey excavated near Lubbock, Texas, that was nine feet high at the shoulder. Fossil buffalo horns have been found with a 12-foot span. Rhinoceroses remains have been found 18 feet tall. And then here's a shark that was estimated to be over eight feet long. All they have is the jaw of him, but the size of the jaw, he must have been oh, 80 feet long. So giantism existed back in those days. Now, not only giantism, but metallurgy was invented by the antediluvian uh, man. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 22, we read, And Zillah, she also bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And so man began to learn how to make brass and iron, or actually bronze and iron, back in, in those days. And on the next page of your note sheets, we have an account of um, dating back to June of 1936 of some of this metal that they found, this iron that they found. And reading, I'm, we want, instead of reading the whole thing here, um, this Mr. and Mrs. Max Hahn of London, Texas, they saw this wooden handle sticking out of this rock. And about 10 years later, their son, he wants to go and see what it is. So he chips away rock, he finds it's metal, it's iron, it's a hammerhead attached to the wood. And so um, he, he digs it out and they send it to Battelle Laboratory in Columbus, Ohio. They did an analysis on the metal. And the report observed 96.6% iron, 2.6% chlorine, and 74 one-hundredths of 1% sulfur, but no carbon, which is normally needed to hide, uh, harden iron. And metallurgists, iron uh, with chlorine cannot be made on Earth in their present atmosphere. They can't duplicate, uh, natu through natural means, they cannot duplicate iron of, the, of this grade of iron. And it, it wasn't until the space age that man could make iron this strong and this good, but man was doing it back there before the flood. Now, because of the fact that um, these are evolutionists, they have to give an explanation for this. And so right away, they come up with 135 million years, and they say that a, a spaceman landed here 135 million years ago and dropped his hammer and left and forgot it, and so that was the hammer that they found. So that's pretty far out. Somebody reject the, the, the biblical definition of it, the natural uh, definition of it is even worse. Now, let's get back to the canopied earth here. They have found subtropical forests 800 miles from the North Pole. And 200 miles from the South Pole, they have found frozen remains of an ancient forest. 200 miles from the South Pole. They have found broadleaf forests that were petrified near Cairo, Egypt. Cairo, Egypt gets three to four inches of rain a year. The Yukon in Canada has long dark winters, but they have found remains there of subtropical lotus seeds found there frozen. The um, islands of northern Siberia, they found a fallen 90-foot fruit tree with green leaves and fresh fruit on its branches. And this is a place on the earth where trees the only trees that grow there are willow trees, and they only grow one, to one inch per year. They have found fossils of butterflies with a 20-inch wingspan. They have found birds with a 25 to 30-foot wingspan, and eggs, birds' eggs, 11 inches in diameter. So it appears that the antediluvian atmosphere is, it contains six to eight times much more carbon dioxide than our present atmosphere. That's what scientists estimated. Now, in Genesis 3.8, the scripture says here, they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, what would be the cool of the day? Well, they believe that the cool of the day was not more than somewhere between two and four degrees cooler than the rest of the day. 
because there was a universal climate from pole to pole here upon the earth. And our planet did not, because of the canopy, did not gain a lot of heat during the daytime. And because of the canopy, did not lose a lot of heat at nighttime. It was, it was perfectly insulated. And this atmosphere contained three to, time, three to five times more water vapor than we have today. The canopy was up there. Now we have a number of verses that bear that out. In Job 38, 9, God says, When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, a swaddling band for it. A swaddling band is what they used to put on babies. It was just a long thing and they just keep wrapping it around and around and around. Well, God said, I made a swaddling band out of water for the earth. It goes round and round and round the earth. In Job 38, 25, who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters or a way for the lightning of thunder? He's asking Job these questions. Uh, in verse 29, out of whose womb came the ice? This canopy is ice. And when uh, we get a little deeper into this study, we're going to see uh, some things concerning the ice that is out there in space and what it very well possibly could have done. In Psalm 104, Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? Thou coverest it with the deep. It's the water again. As with a garment, and the waters stood above the mountains. The mountain uplift took place at the time of the flood, and all the water that is here on the earth now uh, has, has been here ever since the flood. Many have asked the question, what happened to all that water? It's still here. But there was no high mountains or deep valleys at that time. And if you just took planet earth and just leveled it off, made it smooth like a ball, it would be covered with water, every, every part of it. And apparently, back in Genesis 1-2, that's the way it was. And then, but God began to build mountains and valleys and so forth, and so the water ran into the, into the lower parts. Now, the rest of the pages that you have here, uh, the first one there is from a book called Symposium of Creation. It was written in 1968. And we took excerpts from two parts of it, page 102 and page 130 and describing some of the things that have been found in the Arctic and Antarctic areas. Frozen sedges, beans, grasses, and buttercups in full growth have been found quick frozen in Siberia. Amazing. It had to have a warm climate. On many occasions, the plants are found bearing seeds, including cones, they found an elderberry tree was found quick frozen with ripe berries on it in northern Siberia. And ripe berries suggest that this icy catastrophe may have suddenly come upon the region in the fall of the year. Elsewhere in sedimentary strata, full grown foliage and fruit impressions similarly are suggestive that their watery demise occurred either in the late summer or in the autumn. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. And in Genesis chapter 7, we want verse 11. 7 11. Okay. Verse 11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. This is the flood. The God opened the windows of heaven. This is when the canopy came down. That was coupled with the fountains of the deep breaking open and, and coming up from the center of the earth. But God uh, uh, caused the windows of heaven to open, and that was the flood. Now, he gives us the, the date. Here's the date. It says it happened on the second month and the 17th day of the month. Now, in the book of Exodus, God gave Israel a new calendar, one that Israel uses today. It starts in, in uh, April. April is the first month. But prior to that, the old original calendar started in September on the first day of the autumn equinox, the first day of fall, which would be September 22nd. So according to our present calendar today, the original calendar, New Year's Day, would have been September 22nd. 
Okay, now the Bible says that the flood came, the windows of heaven were opened in the second month. Well, if the first month started on, on uh, September 22nd, one month later would be October 22nd, according to our calendars. So October 22nd. Then it says, and the 17th day of the month. And if you add 17 days to October 22nd, you come up with November the 8th. The date of the flood, according to our calendar, is November the 8th. For some reason, God put it in the Bible. He wanted us to know that. The date of the flood is October the 8th. Now, going back to what we just read, this would be in the late fall of the year. And what would you expect from vegetation in the late fall of the year? It would be exactly what they found. Seeds and cones and berries and so forth. Things that we associate with the fall season, late summer or early fall. And remember, the earth had a constant 74 degree uh, temp uh, temperature at that time. It was a subtropical, uh, subtropical climate from pole to pole. Now going down to the second part of this, they asked the question of the evolutionists, or as you see there, the uniformitarianism. Why were dinosaurs quickly drowned and buried in sediment? Why were mammoths quickly drowned in North America and quick frozen in Siberia. Did you know Michigan is full of mammoth bones? They, there's, there's, there's hundreds of them in, uh, under, underneath Michigan. They find, they're finding them all the time. And uh, the ones that were here, um, they, they died. The ones in Siberia, they died also, but they died quick frozen. The meat's still on them. And Eskimos still eat that meat to this day. And they found them with subtropical vegetation in their mouths. We'll have more on this when we get to the flood. Subtropical vegetation in their mouths and stomachs. And then he asked the questions, why were petrified forests found 100 miles from the South Pole by Admiral Byrd? And why were land animals found fossilized in locations below sea level? And why were sea animals found fossilized at high elevations? And so these are questions that the evolutionists cannot answer. Now, bringing it up to date on the next page that you have is from the New York Times, June the 1st of the year 2006. And scientists have come to the conclusion to what Bible believers have come to the same conclusion hundreds of years before. They have come to the conclusion that the Arctic Ocean and the North Pole had a year-round average temperature of 74 degrees. We've been teaching this with Bible creationism for decades. Scientists are just now coming to that conclusion. There was a Florida year-round temperature, 74 degrees. Of course there was. It was the canopy shrouding the earth. It, it diffused the heat. It spread it out evenly all over the face of the earth. Night and day, the temperature didn't change much because it was insulated by that canopy. So you have a, a subtropical climate all over the face of the earth. And then it goes on and says, reading the underlying part here, something extra happens when you push the world into a warmer world, and we just don't understand what it is, said one lead author, Heinz Brinkus, he's an evolutionist, of course, an expert on, Arctic, on ancient Arctic ecology, at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Well, apparently he's not as much of an expert as he thinks because he says we don't understand it. He needs to read his Bible. And then uh, here's the next article here. This is from Fox News, Wednesday, May 31st of 2006. Scientists may have found what might have been the ideal ancient vacation hotspot with a 74 degree Fahrenheit average temperature, alligator ancestors, palm trees smack in the middle of the Arctic. And it goes on and says that the North Pole was practically a subtropical paradise. Three new studies show that. Three different laboratories studying the evidence. And they're all showing the same thing. And it, down at the bottom there, it says, imagine a world where there are dense sequoia trees and cypress trees 
just like in Florida, that ringed the Arctic Ocean. That's the way it was. The next article is also from Fox News. Millions of years ago, the Earth experienced an extended period of natural global warming. They had to get that one in there. But around 55 million years ago, these are evolutionists, they talk in millions of years, 55 million years ago, there was a sudden supercharged spike of carbon dioxide that accelerated the greenhouse effect. No, there wasn't. There was a canopy that did it, but the result is the same here. Um, but the new research found the polar average was closer to 74 degrees. And um, it says it's enough to make Santa Claus break out in a sweat. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not going to read any more of that one. Um, on this next page, the last page you have there, this isn't about the North Pole, this is about the South Pole, the Antarctic. And they found a skeleton of a baby dinosaur, a plesiosaur, I guess you pronounce it, I never heard of it before, which would be a water-dwelling dinosaur. They found the, the fossil remains of it in the Antarctic, down at the South Pole. And so... Um, they are more and more realizing what the Word of God has taught us all along, that the early earth was far different than the earth is today, the earth as we know it. Peter had a name for the early earth. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3. He calls it the world that then was. And he says the world that then was overflowed with water and it perished. And so um, we're going to stop here now and we're going to continue on next week as we get a little deeper into the creation story. Now then, let's look to God in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all of your blessings. Lord, we thank you for what you have told us about the early earth. Lord, we thank you today for what scientists are discovering during our lifetime that when creationists talked about them a generation ago, all they did was laugh. Now they're discovering those very things that are taught, these truths that are taught in the Word of God. And it just reminds us once again, let God be true and every man a liar. Thank you, Lord, for your precious Word. May we study it and learn it and rightly divide it and use it to thy glory. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>